Last night's debate in Nashville between President Trump and his Democratic challenger, Joe Biden, with tens of millions of ballots already cast. Both candidates are trying to make their final pitch to remaining undecided voters in the final 11 days before Election Day. To help us break down key moments and policy disagreements, we are joined by our old friends Leslie Sanchez and Linda Tran. They are both <laughs> CBS News political contributors. Linda is also a Democratic strategist. Uh, Leslie, you are a Republican strategist. So, uh, first of all, um, it's interesting. Uh, you know, it's to me, there's a lot of talk in after these debates, who won the debate, who did better than the other candidate. The, to me, that's not the question, uh, Leslie and Linda. The question is, did the candidates make the case, if you're sitting on the fence and if there are those few voters who are still on the fence right now, um, did you make the case why you should get the shot to be president or be reelected president? Linda, first, did you, do you think that uh, Donald Trump was able to make that case? You know, Vlad, I think you're hitting the nail right on the head. I mean, the truth is both of the gentlemen on stage last night did better than they did in their first matchup. The challenge for Donald Trump is that he didn't do well enough, and Joe Biden did significantly better. You know, I think uh, former President Barack Obama put it best a couple of nights ago when he said, in a re-election campaign, the primary question that voters are asking themselves is, are they better off than they were four years ago? And Donald Trump failed to make a definitive case both in the midst of this pandemic and the ensuing economic crisis, but just in general, what he has done for the American people and, importantly, what his plan would be to make things better for the American people if he were to be awarded a second term. You know, in contrast to that, Joe Biden, you know, had clearly done his homework. He really demonstrated what it looks like when you have an experienced government leader who knows how the processes work, who know what it takes to make sure that there are policies and programs in place that will help ordinary working people. So I think that while both of them definitely improved over the past, uh, honestly, Donald Trump really squandered his one last best opportunity to really reset the narrative and get people focused on the future in a different way. So, Leslie, I'll ask you a very similar question. Uh, you know, the president was certainly um, a lot calmer, did not interrupt as much. Uh, mm -hmm. he, he got some criticism right. uh, for coming in too hot during the September uh, debate, and that's not what we saw at all. You know, how do you assess the performances of the two candidates? Amory, I think the president did extraordinarily well, um, and, and, the, and there's a lot of different reasons. And, and to pull away, and I think Vlad had a really good point. It's not like points, you know, who won back and forth, not like a boxing match. It's were there significant mm -hmm. things that voters take away? Because people are taking it a lot about, oh, 40 plus million, almost 50 million people have voted. There's about 100 million people who have yet to vote. And if we're talking about key states like Pennsylvania, which, which can be moved by four or 5,000 votes, Votes, likely last night for the president was important and what, for, for a few different reasons. One, he looked measured. Yes, that's a big step for the president. But in contrast to that, he looked like he wanted the job. So when you, when you look at Trump next to Biden, Biden looked like, yes, he had rehearsed a lot, but he looked like that kind of tired politician who didn't want to be there. And I also feel he made some significant gaffes uh, that he exposed kind of on his agenda, kind of that big tilt to the left that a lot of kind of folks in the middle worry about with, with Biden. And, and that we can talk about a little bit more, but those key efforts balanced together are why I feel that it was a really important debate uh, for the president. So President Trump made some sporadic attacks on uh, Vice President Biden's son, Hunter, referencing the disputed New York Post story about foreign business dealings. Let's play some of that. I don't make money from China. You do. I don't make money from Ukraine. You do. I don't make money from Russia. You made three and a half million dollars, Joe, and your son gave you. They even have a statement that we have to give 10 percent to the big man. You're the big man, I think. I don't know. Maybe you're not. But you're the big man, I think. Your son said we have to give 10 percent to the big man. Joe, what's that all about? It's terrible. So the question, you know, the vice president should answer questions with regards to his son's business dealings or his own business dealings. That is fair game. But the question becomes, I go back to my original question, Linda and Leslie, 
do voters care about that? 220,000 people dead uh, from the coronavirus, uh, an economy that is in a significant downturn. Uh, even if you, you know, the, the, the uh, protests that we saw in the streets of American cities uh, over police brutality and injustice, um, is this something given that and Vice President Biden did do this, he sort of pivoted the discussion back to President Trump and some of his business dealings, allegations of a secret bank account in China. Uh, he didn't even hit the president. I know that there are some, uh, Linda, who wanted the, the vice president to go for the for him to go after President Trump's own children um, and how they've been en enriching themselves over the course of the last three years. He has not done that. But do people really care about this at this point, this late in the game? You know, in short, I think the answer is no. I think the vice president put it best when he said, people don't care about my family or his family. They care about their own family. We're in the midst of unprecedented crises uh, for our public health, for the economy. They're worried about how they're going to pay their mortgage, not about whether or not the, this, you know, disputed story, as you described it, Vlad, is real or not. Um, so uh, I, th I think that... The former vice president did an excellent job, frankly, in making the pivot because this was really about transparency and the question of whether there is corruption or some of those kinds of unsavory things at play. And when the vice president responded, look, I've never taken a single penny from a foreign source, and I've released 22 years of my tax returns. What are you hiding? That was a very powerful pivot and reminded ordinary everyday folks watching from back home that the president paid $750 in taxes in two years. And so that was something that I think that was handled really well. And again, Vlad, I don't think that people at home are worried about Hunter Biden. Um, we also saw during the debate a discussion about climate change, and there was an exchange uh, between the two candidates directly. I want to play a little bit of that, and then we'll talk. Would you close it's down the oil industry? Way, I would transition from the oil industry, yes. Oh, I would that's transition. a big statement. That's it is a big statement. That's a because big statement. I would stop. Why would you do that? Because the oil industry pollutes significantly. Oh, I see. Here's the deal. But that's you can't a big statement. That. Well, if you let me finish the statement, because it has to be replaced by renewable energy over time. So President Trump um, really, uh, it, it seemed like he felt like he had a Biden on the ropes uh, during this uh, exchange. He sort of, if you could have like a visual, a verbal highlighter, that's what he did. He said, you know, Texas, did you hear what he had to say? So Biden later sought to clarify what he was saying in a press pool afterwards, saying that, you know, we're not going to get rid of fossil fuels. We're going to get rid of the subsidies for fossil fuels. And you can debate whether that would, you know, be an industry killer or not. But as I was listening to that and uh, and all the talk about, um, um, about, um, now I'm sort of losing some of my thoughts, but all the talk about shifting to other forms of energy and fracking in particular. Uh, Leslie, I was wondering, you know, what is the strategy there focusing on that? Um, I think generally uh, the country would like to see, you know, uh, something, something would like to see uh, climate change addressed. And it seemed like fracking oil the impact is limited to just a handful of states. So can you talk to me about the strategy of the president really sort of underlying, underlining what Biden had to say? That was extraordinarily important. Um, and, and the president called it a grave error. It was monumental uh, error in terms of what it exposed with Biden. And now I'm from Houston, Texas, right? So I come from an oil and gas town. Mm. Oil, the oil and gas industry is extraordinarily significant to the U.S. economy. It's ex and, and there's so many different areas you could talk about it in fossil fuels or renewable energies or clean gas or co that's Colorado. I mean, we could go on and on about the impacts it has. And there's this debate and this balance between holding corporations, energy companies accountable. You know, you know, we could be all around that. Sure. But what Biden was saying was, was really kind of jaw dropping in terms of his attack on the energy industry. And Trump was right. That was on the ropes. And, and people in, in Pennsylvania, when he's talking about ending fracking and it, it talk, you, people criticize the president for saying, oh, the vac you know, one day there'll be a vaccine and the, and the pandemic will be over. That's kind of how it sounds with Biden saying, oh, we're going to have all these new kind of technologies and energy. And one day we will just eliminate fossil fuels. Yes. 
but there's a lot to that and an entire industry and a lot of jobs that are connected to that. So it's not a throwaway statement. That was the biggest gap of the night. Um, and it's going to have an impact on a lot of these states that are, that are in that kind of new blue belt uh, country, you know, kind of middle Rust Belt territory that will decide this election. Uh, for all the talk about a more agreeable tone, President Trump did spark some outrage when he made comments about criminals coming through the border and immigrants. I thought this was sort of a, a I mean, my, I was pretty shocked when you heard the president say that some of the people who were coming back to this country had low IQs. Uh, and they being the only ones who follow the law and show up for court. Um, Leslie, what did you make of that exchange? I mean, uh, you know, people who are coming across the border are seeking a better life in this country, uh, and you can debate the issues around immigration and what's the best way to proceed forward as a country, but to suggest that people who are coming here seeking a better life for their children um, and for themselves, and then the people that are coming back for have low IQs. I mean, it just sort of echoed what and, we heard. And Vlad, yeah. you know, just to expand on that, he was talking about the people who were coming back to court. He was talking about the catch and release right. program. So he was saying that the right. people who were willing to follow the law to prove that they, are you know, in part want to be good American citizens must not be too bright. Right. I, it was it was pretty remarkable. If the president says, I don't agree with that statement at all. It's, a, it's an ignorant statement, quite honestly. For, you know, it's kind of one of like, he's saying something that doesn't make a lot of sense mm -hmm. and, and nobody really believes that. The bigger point, Vlad, is that it's this, co this whole debate about open borders. Yes, people want to come to the land of liberty and come to the shiny city on the hill and come to America because of all the things and the, rule, the respect for rule of law and all the opportunity this great country has. But there's a legal way to do that. There's been an ongoing debate about, you know, the, the Democrats have this kind of open borders, everyone come in, forget the fact you've already been in line trying to do it the right way. And if you ask immigrants if they want to come here legally or illegally, they'll take the legal route. We just have a system that is broken that has never worked for them. So now Biden is out here saying, okay, for all the 11 plus million undocumented people in the country, let's just make them U.S. citizens. Wow, wait a minute. There's a lot of conservative Democrats. A lot of people just don't agree with that because there are criminal aliens in this group. So there, the system is broken. How do you find a way to address it? Saying open the border and just, you know, everyone come in and release everybody is not the solution. I think that's the bigger point the president was trying to make. Um, it's always good having you guys. Miss you guys. I really enjoy sort of getting <laughs> both perspectives, right, um, from people who know what it's like on mm -hmm. the inside. Um, so Leslie Sanchez, Linda Tran, thank you so much. Thank you guys. Thank you.